90s were not that strict when it came to violence in video games. They were just beginning to become more realistic, graphics-wise, and conservative people didn't rush into blaming every problem on video games. Carmageddon, inspired by poor Balto's action film Death Race 2000, let the players be a part of insane, absurd races. To win, the main character has to deal with rivals, pedestrians, and even animals. Racing areas are just a mess, and extreme cruelty and bloodiness add spice to the game. Let me tell you that brutality lovers really enjoyed it. Hello everyone, what's good? This is Nightclub Play, and today we're gonna talk about one of the nastiest, cruelest, deranged game series. There are several Carmageddon games that were released between 1997 and 2016, and I'm gonna tell you about all of them because What's more brutal than races slash mass murders going on with heavy metal music playing in the background? So, if you are having a meal, stop for your own sake and enjoy this video. Carmageddon came to life thanks to Patrick Buckland, who started as a freelance programmer for Apple II and Neil Barden, who never really tried himself in game production but was a graphic designer for Condon Design and The Body Shop. They both enjoyed racing simulators, but there were not a lot of racing survivals in the 90s, so they decided to make one themselves. Firstly, they established their own company, Stannis Games. Then they hired six people to help with their development. Still, Patrick and Neil had to do a lot themselves, even the outsourcing. At that time, the team was working on a racing game demo, inspired by a demolition derby. It's a racing survival without any particular rules. Your main goal is simple – take out your opponents. The idea was ditched because mostly publishing companies found the concept quite questionable. Only one company, SCI, decided to sign the contract, but insisted the game was to be licensed. The developers really wanted to get the license to make the game in the Mad Max universe, but the owner was nowhere to be found. They still got lucky, because there was a comic on Death Race 2000 and a movie sequel in production. The Death Race 2000 movie, influenced by Stainless Games' future project, Carmageddon. Unfortunately, the movie sequel got cancelled when the game production was in the final stages, and the publisher could have easily stopped the funding, but still allowed the project to be completed. It was obvious where the developers got their inspiration from. The vehicles have saws, drills and blades. You get credits for committing a literal vehicular manslaughter. The plot resembles the Death Race movie too. The government established a totalitarian regime and set up deadly car races to somehow calm the population down. Little did they know. If you think there were no obstacles left, you are wrong. The game might not have come out at all. Yep, you heard it all right. You see, it was time to advertise the game, and to do that, one needs to give it an H rating. It's not a secret that the censors didn't like the game, putting it lightly. Rumors of the violence present in the game got leaked to the press. It was not going to be a warm welcome, obviously. Journalists call for the game's cancellation, otherwise it could spoil the youth. The game was criticized from all sides. H Concern sent a message to the company, demanding to remove elderly pedestrians from the game. Also, a blind pressure group in Australia was quite offended by the blind pedestrian power-up, which helped the player demolish pedestrians without being noticed. We all know there is no such thing as bad publicity. All the controversy made the game insanely popular. Apart from haters, the game got an army of fans. 200 fan sites were created within a year, and the first few years 2 million copies were sold. An incredible result, if you ask. Also, the game got like dozens of different modifications. The game that was seemingly destined to flop later became the first of the series that now has 5 games. The world is in disorder. Bandits have almost more power than the government. After an ecological disaster, the atmosphere was polluted. Parts of the world's population is dead, and some of them are zombies. Panic takes over, and the people start to riot, and the government, in order to save its own ass, set up a death race, where the winner gets a chance to be sent to the Paradise Island that was not influenced by the apocalypse. Five. The 
like Armageddon game is not all unicorns and rainbows, so in the end the main character gets prizes and understands that they got shit on and there's no paradise island. So the main character brutally punishes the organizers of the race. Hype aside, the game was highly praised as an unusual and innovative racing game. Two years before there was an open world drive, local races took place in huge areas. So, six cars participate in a race, and the player can choose the starting location, which doesn't matter at all because there are three ways in which you can win a race. Go through all the checkpoints like in a normal race game, destroy your opponents and run over all the pedestrians on the map. Such variety of choice was surely new. During a race, or rather, a battle, there's a timer, and if the time is out, the race is considered lost. In order to win, you have to physically humiliate your opponents, or be an asshole and run over all pedestrians. Given that you can repair your car mid-race by pushing back space, you can consider it almost invincible. So your only struggles will be finances and time. There are two playable characters, really sick in the heads. Max Damage, a mad Max wannabe, and Diana, a psychotic madwoman. Max's car is heavy, it's not very fast but delivers more damage. Anna's car is faster, but not heavy. You can also upgrade your cars in three ways. Armor, races defense stats of your car. Power, races engine power, and offensive raises offensive stats. Carmageddon was originally designed as an arcade game, but the models look like they are on another level. There are no two cars that have identical controls. A model of a ruined car is also present in the game, so you finish the race driving something that resembles a chute gum cut on fire. Apart from your opponents, there are cops on their tanks that can well be as wicked as you and run over pedestrians or animals or brutally crush you into the nearest wall. All those huge locations are fun to explore. There are pickups carted all over the area with all kinds of power-ups. Some of them are your friends and give you a destroyer or a mutant tail that delivers damage. Or you can eat shit and cry about how unlucky you are if a power-up actually breaks your car or makes it hope all the time. One of the shittest power-ups is the one that decreases gravity. Imagine the chaos in the close areas. Cars crashing into walls at supersonic speeds while breaking the skulls of all the pedestrians that were minding their own business. What makes the game more realistic is an icon of our nuts racer in the upper left corner. These are actors recorded live reactions to everything going on in the game. After successfully completing missions, the player gets new cars, new upgrades and new locations. The gory and bloody fights are accompanied by the soundtrack by heavy metal bands Fear Factory. Isn't it romantic? Only few people know, but an official DLC was released on November in 1997, Spec Pack, in which new vehicles, power-ups and levels were added. The game made a lot of people doubt that God still existed. Some countries are under censorship. Human pedestrians were replaced by zombies with green blood or by robots with black blood. But it didn't cause any damage to the game's image. The public interest was still there. Carmageddon has always been a great arcade game with its huge garage, with an insane amount of vehicles, huge racing airs that you can use however you want, and power-ups that can fuck you up good. The game is fun, cruel and unfair at times, but developers never asked their game to be considered anything else. They just wanted the players to have a good time, in a way that can be considered stupid, and in a way that can make your parents call an ambulance. Great sales and rating. Let's send this game's release a sequel in record time. 1998 is the year when the fans could enjoy dozens of powers of pure mess and chaos of the controversial game. Carmageddon 2 is still considered the best part of the series. The gameplay and the main concept of the game didn't change much. You still participate in races without rules, cruelly get rid of your opponents hunt pedestrians like in the store consultants, and just get to the finish first, which is the most boring way. Nobody loves it. The glow up happened mostly to the graphics which became noticeably better. Full 3D and stats of sprites of pedestrians made the game more enjoyable. 
Also, car animations became even more better. You can crush them into pieces, literally every piece of them can be detached starting from bumpers and doors to mirrors and hoods. All in all, you can make it a pile of useless metal. There were some questionable things going on with the game too though. Let's start from roasting pedestrians, for real. Look at them. Ugly model that drop like sucks of shits when you hit them and pixel blood doesn't make it better. Too unrealistic. There are more animals in the game like dogs, but they look as stupid as the pedestrians. Cars physics became worse, their controls feel clumsy and heavy, so you will have to get used to the gameplay from NU. The menu has changed just like the graphics, there's nothing out of place, nothing too overwhelming, just area and car choice options. There's no more rating system in the game, just 3 got all races and a mission, which is a time mission, not difficult to pass but easy to get tired of. There are more cars and characters in the game now, so if you want another sick madman, you have plenty of choice. Or if you want to ride a Ford Mustang or fly on a World War II plane, you won't be disappointed. Don't get me started with the Conquest Paver and the Combined Harvester. What I love most about Carmageddon 2 is the accompanying soundtrack. Stanley's games chose Iron Manic songs and it was a great choice. Such great hits as the Trooper, Be Quick or Be Dead and Falling Down certainly fit the game perfectly. It's anything, they simply implemented everything that wasn't possible before. Carmageddon was transformed almost beyond recognition. The second part became the best of the series. Unfortunately, it couldn't be achieved for the second time. Despite the success of two Carmageddon parts, the developers got into debts. The studio hired 30 people too quickly and didn't know how to manage them financially. As a result, the team had to negotiate with VIS Entertainment about their takeover in order to keep afloat. At the same time, Stainless had to end its partnership with SCI. The rights to Carmageddon were transferred to the publisher, and the publisher assigned the next part to another company. Let's see how it turns out. The third part of the series is the one that can be named. The fans think about it only if they are cursing it out. What else do you expect from a game that has shitty and uncanonical in Steam description? So what's all the fuss about? Firstly, Taurus Games, the developer, previously worked on portable console games only and wasn't ready to pull off a game of such level. However, they improved the graphics a lot made the new menu design look very nice and fitting for the game series. All good until you actually start the game. You don't have to go far, just look at the starting location. Whatever was the designer on while doing that? I want the crack too. Ultramarine sky, yellow mountains, cartoonish trees and pale grass. It's that one nephew's drawing that is so ugly, but you can't tell him that. Fortunately, they are not constant in the game, just a few maps. Most of the locations are grim, dark cities, dirty industrial zones and wastelands, just like in the original game. The pedestrians look like they are going through a retrograde mercury, guys in gorilla costumes, prostitutes, aggressive armed freaks with Molotov cocktails. They don't run away from you, they become sassier and they fight you back. Also, they are not that easy to kill anymore. Now it's not enough to rip all their limbs, they have too much will to live. Now you have to hit them at high speed to get what you really want. It's not like the gameplay in TDR 2000 has been changed drastically. No, but it was noticeably diversified. In addition to the power-ups from the first part, there are a lot of new weapons. Spiky tails, mines and nukes capable of starting an apocalypse for your enemies. With all those items, you can kill your opponents way faster than in the first game making the races less tedious. On the other hand, it is also possible to be destroyed during the race, as the third part has more opportunities to get destroyed by taking an infamous pinball power-up. It is also a must to mention a very well-made physics. Cars don't feel like they are made out of cardboard, and it's quite difficult to be a shitty driver even if you turn and drive at high speed. The biggest difference is that this game has a story mode, Apart from the usual derby races, there are missions where we get a briefing on how to pass them. What's sad is that mostly those missions are the same. 
gather all three axes and get them to the Y, and obviously, some foes will be there to distract us and get in our way. But there are some that might be quite entertaining like driving with a nuke attached to your car or destroying sharks. The main idea of those missions is to make the gameplay less monotonous, and it works really good, if you ask me. The plot isn't really brand new or brilliant or super original, it repeats itself for the third time, although there are little twists to it. The game doesn't stray away from the other games of the series and has several versions, with zombies instead of the usual pedestrians and all kinds of gangs, thugs and murders for the original version. TDR 2000 does have its disadvantages, but still present the remnants of the original and has a gameplay that is still able to get you interested. Unfortunately, the press trashed the game completely, its average score in Metacritic is only 48 points. The developers of the original don't consider this game canonical at all. Years went by with non-use of the sequel, all this time the original authors wanted to return to Kermageddon. To be able to do this, they first had to steal the rights from the Japanese company, Square Enix. The developers got the chance to revive Kermageddon when crowdfunding became popular. In 2013, Stannis began fundraising on Kickstarter. They promised to bring goods of Kermageddon back for $400,000. In the end, the company managed to gather over $600,000 and the project got its chance. But life is no fairy tale, and the creators of the original game failed to repeat their success. In fact, we see the same god's old game reborn with all the modern features. Modern graphics, new but still recognizable maps, and couple of new modes, and our favorite rating and Steam achievement system. The game introduced new vehicles, Eagle R, driven by our old friend Max Damage, Havk R, Tanisha with a Terminator wannabe behind the wheel, and many others. Two more modes were added to the familiar pop races, but they still have the same vibe to them. The winner is the one who first analyzes a certain number of marked pedestrians, or passes through a certain number of checkpoints. The mod is better played in the multiplayer. It's just more fun when you have real competition. So guys, I'd like to talk about the most controversial part of the game, pedestrians torture. The game introduced a variety of new ways to make them suffer. New power-ups let you rip all their limbs and heads, make them shake in a wild dance, panic or freeze on the spots. The farther you go, the more insufferable the cops and the bots become. They get better cars, get more aggressive, just like you when you are hungry. So, to be on the same level of coolness as them, you have to gather tokens which you can use to get upgrades, like better chases or rims at the garage. Hermageddon reincarnation is far from a primitive arcade. All the cars are different in terms of driving, and some of them are hard to get used to. There are also damaged car models, so the physics of the game is really realistic. Cars can crumble, say goodbye to their wheels, doors and bumpers. The best part is that in the multiplayer mode you can't repair your car, so it can be a real pain in the ass if it happens mid-race. It's hard to fully hate or love the game. On the one hand, it's not the same when it comes to the most unapologetic and offensive humor. Pedestrians look cartoonish and clumsy, and cars models look like toys, even if you compare it to Born Out. On the other hand, the game takes us back to the original and brings back the nostalgia and all the warm feelings. Of course, snobbish AAA lovers won't even spare a glance at the game, but the 90s babies will surely have the time of their lives. Reincarnation was a very long awaiting game, that's why the audience loved it one way or another. After that, the audience had high expectations, it was waiting for something even better something innovative and interesting. Stainless Games released Max Damage in 2016, and after their release, it was obvious they never wanted to be innovative, they didn't want to take all the criticism into account. Instead, they decided to just fix a couple of flaws and add some new content. Everything that Max Damage inherited from its ancestor didn't look as groundbreaking as it did 19 years before. 
the only thing that you can take away from the Karma series is that they don't make such gritty, black sock traces nowadays. Most of the positive reviews are the same. Yes, the sequel is half S and only remotely resembles the original, but is better than nothing. Either way, the main idea of the game is the same – fuck up your opponents and pedestrians. You can't argue that the game is huge and has the most curious map design. There is always a lot of action going on, something or someone explodes, a bloody mess is blocking the view, sparks fly everywhere and the metal grinds menacingly. All in all, an utter mess. Yes, there is a lot of action on the screen, but is this the real thrill of the game? Previous games didn't have so many animals, and each victim was kinda special. Now almost all the maps are filled to the brim with potential corpses, and it's almost impossible to go 100 meters without hearing a nice crunch under the wheels. Is it as entertaining as it was in the 90s? No, not at all. An ordinary race game doesn't seem so boring anymore. The opponents act like they are on a suicide mission. They make sharp turns right at the finish, try to crash into the other drivers, if not into a wall. What's good is that the power-ups are still here to make the game more brutal. For example, you can find an unwill launcher, which can damage the opponent's bonnets. In addition, there are shine tokens scattered around the map. You need them to make your vehicle significantly stronger. I had nothing bad to say about the vehicles. Psychopaths and freaks have rolled out their clunkers on the track to satisfy their craving for endless violence. The cars look menacing, but in reality they are just a pile of junk. The controls are kinda tricky, and it's easier to drive on a tank than on any other questionable vehicle in the game. It's safe to say that Max Damage is just a slightly better version of Reincarnation. The developers polished it a little, bettered the technical parts, got rid of flags, and added a little more brightness. But it all just looks like a very sad attempt to milk out the money from the fans without even trying to work through the previous year's feedback. Stanley's games work safe, Reincarnation and Max Damage don't look as controversial or bold like in the 90s. Those games shocked the audience, caused controversies and debates, and attracted attention. The new ones don't have the spice anymore. Obviously, something has gone wrong. Maybe the times have changed, and such projects just don't click anymore. No, that's not the problem. The success of Fallout, Crash Day, and the recently released Trail Out shows that the genre does have its fans. Unfortunately, Stanley's Games doesn't even try to develop the idea of the previous games to move it forward. It's just trying to repeat its previous success doing the bare minimum, and as you can see for yourself, it's not working. The latest release of the series is a drag racing simulator coming on Crashers with a 4.4 rating on Metacritic. Obviously, it's not what the fans want. The most dedicated fans, who primarily associate Carmageddon with Nitus projects, were crashing everything that moves under your wheels, made all the fury and rage, and madness ooze uncontrollably. Thankfully, a re-release of the original game is now available on mobile devices. Maybe one day we will get what we desire – a full re-release of the series. But for now, we can only sit on our asses and hope that the developers will somehow listen to the community. Talking about the series made me truly nostalgic about those times. I hope you feel the same and I hope you're already leaving your precious comments about your favorite parts of Karma. If so, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and give us a lot of thumbs ups. Until next time, see you then!